Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, uh, I apologize for us being slightly late. Uh, I, will, I promise I'll be very brief because I want to leave the floor to our distinguished speaker this morning. Uh, so in terms of uh, protocol, Professor Jagesal, Pro-Chancellor Chairperson of Council, His Lordship Mr. Duma, Mr. Larry Farrell, Founder and Chairman of the Farrell Company USA, Members of Council and Senate, Mr. Ken Punusami, Managing Director, Board of Investment, Directors and Representatives of Public and Private Organizations, I see Mr. Giozu as well, welcome. University colleagues and students, Distinguished guests, good morning. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to this uh, colloquium entitled Why Entrepreneurial Economies are the Most Sustainable Economic Development Tool and How to Create Entrepreneurial Companies in Mauritius by Mr. Larry Farrell, founder and chairman of the Farrell Company USA. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great privilege and honor that I introduce you to the world acclaimed speaker in the field of entrepreneurship, Mr. Larry Farrell, whom I had the opportunity to listen on Wednesday at the Mauritius Africa Partnership Conference. He is just brilliant, you will soon discover for yourself. And re I really wanted university students, colleagues, and all staff members to be able to be exposed to his talk. You will soon discover for yourself. Just a small introduction, the Farrell Company USA is the world's leading firm for researching and teaching entrepreneurship and does groundbreaking research into the high growth business practices of the world's great entrepreneur. He has personally taught entrepreneurship to leading global 1,000 companies, world-class universities, and government agencies. Mr. Larry Farrell is also the author of four bestsellers in the field of entrepreneurship and has received praise from world-famous gurus like Peter Drucker, Tom Peters, and more. His books, including the latest, The Entrepreneurial Age, has received critical acclaim and have been translated into numerous languages. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you a discovery of the different continents from Mr. Farrell's talk this morning. And with these few introductory words, I'm pleased to invite Mr. Farrell to address you. And on behalf of the University of Mauritius, I would like to thank him for his distinguished presence among us and for inspiring our staff and students through this colloquium today. Thank you. Thank you. I put my clock here so we don't go over, okay? <laughs> don't you hate the speakers who just speak and speak and speak and you're looking at your next appointment and so on. Okay, so is my, uh, what do I do here? Put it up? As the Vice Chancellor said, uh, I'm in Mauritius uh, for the week, actually. Uh, I'm primarily the uh, my host is primarily the Board of Investment, Government of Mauritius, uh, and they've been keeping me very busy. As we say, they're getting their money's worth, many, many speeches and talks, <laughs> uh, which is good, which is very nice. We're going to talk in a practical way about the power of the entrepreneurial spirit and uh, how it can be applied uh, to individuals, to existing companies, and, uh, and to entire countries. So I'm going to cover a broad area uh, this morning because I think we have a rather diverse group. We have students, we have faculty, administrators, and so on. All right. So uh, let me mention, uh, introduce my own company. Uh, as the Vice Chancellor mentioned, we uh, research and teach entrepreneurship. We've been in business about 31 years, and uh, we teach, uh, so far, we've taught about six million students over the 30 years in, a, in a, a lot of different countries. We actually teach in nine different languages and uh, we have 22 offices or so around the world. Uh, it's important, the, the last point there, the worldwide application of entrepreneurship is quite broad. 
There are three important segments that I want to talk about this morning. Right? The first segment would be, for example, like you students, individuals. Right? Uh, this is the classic entrepreneur type, the young person, or may maybe not so young these days, could be middle-aged even, uh, who wants to start a business for the first time entrepreneur. These students, we do not teach in our own seminars, we teach through universities, such as the University of Mauritius. And so we're very, uh, we, we have contracts to teach in China, Philippines, Brazil, US, and uh, Europe, and so on. Uh, second market, second segment that is important uh, to us is the large corporation, believe it or not. The, the large company like IBM or Coca-Cola or McDonald's, they use our training because they realize that as an organization, as a company becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, they slow down. They, they become slower and slower and slower like a big bureaucracy, all right? And these companies, they want their managers and executives to behave in a more entrepreneurial way. So the training seminar is called Corporate Entrepreneurship, and it happens to be our biggest market. About 70% of our worldwide business comes from large corporations. The final market segment that is important to, our to me is uh, working through governments. Normally, we would work through an agency such as the Mauritius Board of Investment, to help create a more entrepreneurial economy in a country, right? This, it turns out, is very important in the world today. Uh, I've learned over 30 years that entrepreneurship actually is much more important for poor people than rich people, all right? Or like people like us, it's, it's more important for people in poverty to find some way to get out of poverty than it is to teach entrepreneurship to upper class and so on. I look around this room, you're all educated, you look rather well fed, <laughs> nice clothes, and the fact is, in life, because of your status, you have options in, in your life. You have options for your career, for your life, and so on. Poor people don't have options, you see? And so we like to come in to work in, in poor countries, not Mauritius, but in poorer areas, <coughs> to help people alleviate poverty through starting their own micro-business home family business, okay? Very, very, very in, uh, important aspect of entrepreneurship. Okay, let me start by uh, trying to explain what, what is our definition, what is entrepreneurship actually, what is it? Uh, sometimes uh, it can be a bit confusing because entrepreneurship is not something so well defined uh, by most people. And uh, what we decided to do, well, let me, uh, say, say the the first exercise we use. Like yeah. Mic, be nice. Very, very nice. Yeah. Thank you. The first exercise that we do in all of our seminar workshops is uh, application number one, and we ask students. Suppose tomorrow, for the first time in your life, you go and try to you want to start your own small business. First time, right? Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you just have an idea you want to try. So what, whatever the reason, all right? The question is, the important question here is, what are the most important things you have to do to create a successful small business? What are the three or four critical things you must do? Now, this is a very important question. If you don't know the answer to this question, don't start the company, please. Huh? Because it, probably will fail, all right? So keep this in mind. I'm going to try to answer that in a certain way for you uh, right, right now. now uh, the answer, the research that we've done, we decided not to try to give a textbook definition of entrepreneurship, like a, a psychological definition, you know, oh, she hated her father, she, she, he loved his mother, who cares, all right? What we try to do 
was to actually research and examine what entrepreneurs actually do to start a business. What, 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 what did Steve Jobs really do to start the great Apple computer? How, what did he do? Or going back in history, what did Walt Disney do to start the Disney company? How did he come up with the idea of Mickey Mouse, his first product? You know? How did that happen? What did he do? Okay? So our research is very empirical. We look at the entrepreneur and say, this is, these are the main steps they follow. They seem to follow. And I'll try to explain them now. Uh, oh, by the way, the topic, entrepreneurship, is also very global. You know, it's one of those subjects that you can teach in every country in the world, more or less the same. Right? The entrepreneur in China and Brazil, United States and Mauritius, more or less doing the same things, the same steps. All right? They follow the same steps. In fact, I'm very proud that all, all of my books, all four, all of my books <laughs> have been translated into Chinese, also in China. Right? And in fact, this one, this, this book, the name of it in English is Getting Entrepreneurial. That book was on the bestseller list in China about five years ago, a, a bestseller business books. So I went to Beijing to meet the publishing company, and I was so proud of myself, so proud. To have a book on the bestseller list in China, I was very proud. The publisher, the lady there talking to me, she said, Mr. Farrell, don't be so proud. Huh? <laughs> Today, any book with the title Entrepreneur on the cover will be a bestseller in China. <laughs> now, the, uh, as the Vice Chancellor mentioned, Dr. Dr. Peter Drucker was the 20th century's expert on management. Okay, most around the world we would agree. He was the leading expert. We call him the father of modern management, how to run a company. Okay, very famous guy. He's dead now. Uh, he died about uh, eight years ago. But I was giving this speech, a speech like this, in uh, Taiwan maybe 15 years ago. And Dr. Drucker, the world's greatest expert on management, was sitting right in the front row, right here in front of me. He was old. He had a hearing aid, had a cane already. And because I make a lot of jokes about managers and MBAs, because I can make jokes about MBAs because I have an MBA. I, I know how ridiculous it can be in an MBA, okay? <laughs> so I was afraid if I make too many jokes, Dr. Drucker will stand up and say something bad about me. It could be the end of my career, you see? No, he didn't say anything bad. He came up to speak after me, and he said this. Bigger is better turned out to be another 20th century myth. And, and Larry Farrell has explained why. And what he was talking about was our research here. This is our basic research model. We wanted to understand what is entrepreneurship. And so we decided to look at the life cycle of companies. And when you begin to research the history of companies, you learn something quite interesting. They go through a common life cycle, and, and they usually die after 50 years, 100 years. Companies do not last forever. I, when I was young, I didn't realize that. You know? I thought Coca-Cola forever, but not true. In fact, 100 years ago, if you look at a list of the 100 biggest companies in the United States, 100 years ago, only 16 still in business. So they have a life cycle, okay? Now, of course, we, People have a life cycle. Countries have a life cycle. Everything. If you're Buddhist, you don't mind the life cycle. It's nice. You die, you come back at a better cycle. <laughs> but if you're like me, if you're Christian, this is difficult because you know we have one chance, one life. Anyway, what we found out in research: every organization, university, company, government has a startup time. And if you're working, I'll say, in a business, or even a university, at the startup, in the beginning, it's very exciting. 
If you've ever worked in a new business or a new activity, a new department at the university, you know that it's an exciting time. You're doing something different and new. So the, to the company, in a startup phase, you can hear, this phase usually lasts about five or 10 years, something like that. Usually with three to 10 people, small, small group of people. Very excited though, they're very excited, very passionate about what they're doing. Now we know from research that two out of three startups fail. Only one out of three succeeds, about, okay? So if you're one of the lucky companies, a good company, you go from phase one, startup, to phase two, high growth. The high growth phase can last maybe 20 years, 30 years sometimes. And today, the companies like Facebook and these Google, these companies, they're growing so fast, 20%, 30% per year, unbelievable, okay? So they grow quite fast for 20 more years up here. So now they're here, up here. They're now about, the company about 30, 40 years old by now. <coughs> and something really important happens. If you're working in that company, you begin to realize everything is slowing down. Huh? You used to move very quickly, and, and, and the vice chancellor heard this the other day. She liked this particular story. Reminded, she said, reminded her of university <laughs> a bit. <laughs> in the old days, in the small company, if I'm an employee and I want to spend a hundred dollars, I go to the boss and I, the entrepreneur, and I say, "Can I spend a hundred dollars on this?" And she tells me yes or no immediately. Answer made quick, like that, okay? Fast decisions. Up here, today, we now have 5,000 employees. I go to the boss and I say, can I spend $100 on something? And she says, we have to study it. Huh? <laughs> we have to send it to committee. We have to analyze it. After we analyze it, we send it to the finance department. They analyze it some more, huh? This takes three months. I'm only asking for $100, huh? It takes three months to get a decision, and usually the decision is no, you can't spend it. <laughs> okay, that's one thing. The company is becoming a bureaucracy, okay? Too big, all right? The other thing that happens at this stage, the other important factor, the original entrepreneurs are now 60 years old, 65. Time to retire. Huh? In the United States, we usually go to Florida or somewhere like that to retire. Here in Mauritius, I don't know where you go. Where do you go? To the beach, maybe. Huh? You stay. <laughs> this is a nice place. I, maybe I should retire here. It would be very nice, okay? But anyway, these entrepreneurs, they go, they retire. They go away. And I've never seen an entrepreneur who replaced himself with another entrepreneur. They always replace themselves with MBA type people, professional managers, okay? So it's, that's a very critical factor, okay? <laughs> the entrepreneurs go away. So what you have here is a big company becoming slow, bureaucracy, no longer led by the entrepreneur people, but led by professional managers with MBAs from the business school, okay? Now what happens to, at that stage? This is the time, right here, they begin to slow down, decline. This is the time the companies call in the management consultants. You see? <laughs> These 28-year-old young people and so on. And, I, and I, as she said, I, I went to Harvard Business School myself, so I, I know this and I became a consultant. When I, fir when I first graduated from Harvard Business School, I became a consultant because everyone from Harvard Business School, we only took two jobs, management consultant or investment banker, those two. That's all we do. Mm -hmm. Nobody from Harvard takes an honest job. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I was a consultant. And what I began to realize was that every consulting assignment I was on, we went into big companies. I was 28 years old. 
The CEO of the company was making five million dollars a year, but he didn't know what to do. So he was asking me what to do. You see? I didn't know what to tell him. So I would make something up. <laughs> do this, do that, you know? And what happened was we almost always made the situation worse. Okay? We accelerated their decline. <coughs> so we drove them into space for survival and death. Now, this simple research, the life cycle, it applies, as I said, to the company, but it also applies to people. We're born, we grow up, we get old, we begin to decline, we lose our hair, we can't see, and we die. Life cycle, very important. Huh? Countries the same, economies. Economies grow, they rise up, they get rich, they become complacent and lazy, and they become poor. It happens. So this is common. What's important to us here is to recognize that at least in the business model, on this side, right here, the dominant style is managerial. These are managers managing this enterprise. Huh? On this side, the dominant style is entrepreneurial. Now, we all know what the management practices are. Dr. Drucker, the famous Dr. Drucker, he wrote a book in 1946. He outlined the management practices. Nothing changed. Planning, leading, organizing, controlling. The key management practices still exist today. We all can know that. It's easy to learn, right? The question, though, is not how to manage. It's how to grow. So we need to ask, what are the entrepreneurial practices? Are there entrepreneurial practices we can apply, we can learn? And the answer, I think, is yes. And here they are. Number one. First, we recognize there are the two styles. The science of management, the magic of entrepreneurship. You may recognize this is Disney World. Well, Disney, OK? We call it magic because we're not quite sure what it is. What did he do? Over here, it's science. We know this, OK? One, two, three, four, the rules. This picture is the Baker Library of Harvard. I never went inside the library. <laughs> I don't know what's in there. Books, I think. <laughs> OK? But there's the two styles. And on the, on the entrepreneurial side, here are the key practices of entrepreneurship. So this, what, this is what we think is entrepreneurship. Number one, I never met an entrepreneur who did not believe that what she or he was doing was important. They all believe they're doing something so important with their little business. And they all love their product. They invent some product. Yeah? And they're just crazy about this product. They think it's better, more important than penicillin, more, the most important thing in the world. And what we learn about these entrepreneurs is one bad thing, they, they talk too much about if you know any entrepreneurs and you go to a party with them, they talk, 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 talk. Huh? Am I right about this? You know? They drive you crazy, huh? They're talking about their product all the time. In fact, because I know so many entrepreneurs now, and I know they talk too much about their product, when I get on an airplane and I sit for a long flight, I don't want to talk to the. If the person looks like an entrepreneur sitting next to me, I don't want to talk to him. All right? And this is actually a true story. I. Uh, was flying San Francisco, Singapore. It's about 18 hours, long, long flight. So of course it's important who's sitting next to you for 18 hours, right? right? And usually I get on and I put on the headsets. I look at the movie. I don't want to talk, mm -hmm. right? especially if it looks like an entrepreneur. Right? <laughs> on this flight, it's true. On this flight, I looked to the young man sitting next to me. He looked. He looked like this guy right here, very strong. He looked, he looked like an athlete, not an entrepreneur, didn't look like an, he didn't look like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, okay? He looked normal, okay? So I decided, okay, okay, I'll take a chance. So I turned to this young man and I said, how are you? We're still sitting on the ground in San Francisco, okay? What a mistake that was. <laughs> it turns out he was an entrepreneur. He was from the city of Seattle, 
which is the home of Microsoft, Amazon, yeah. Starbucks, it's, been, it's an entrepreneurial hub, okay, we say. And it turns out that he had invented a product he was going to Asia to sell. And he started talking about his product. And we're still sitting on the ground in San Francisco, and I'm thinking, 70, 18 hours. <laughs> you know? And I could never shut him up. He just kept talking and talking. And what was his product? This is really interesting. His product, he had invented a machine that made artificial sand, <coughs> sand for the sand trap of a golf course. Okay? He thought this was the most important thing in the world. And he talked to me. I never knew there was so much to learn about sand and sand traps, you know? <laughs> right? All the way over, 18 hours, I heard about this. Now, I don't like golf. I don't play golf. I don't watch it on TV. I think it's a bit of a stupid game, actually. It's a bunch of old fat men, usually. <laughs> Hit a ball, they walk along. <laughs> But I had to listen to this for 18 hours from him. But the important point is he had this. He had a sense of mission about his work, about his career, his product. And whether you're a professor or a business person, this is important. This gives him competitive advantage over bureaucrats and other companies. Okay, that's so, so characteristic number one, I love what I do, I have a sense of mission about it. Very important in life. Of course, you, you want to do something in your life that you love, don't you? You don't want to spend 30, 40 years working at a job you hate, you want to be doing something you enjoy, naturally, okay. Number two, customer product vision. To the entrepreneur, the two most important words, customer and product. If you don't have a customer and a product, you don't have a business. It's simple. Um, and actually, we try to make it into one word, customer slash product, like one single idea. Because imagine, the great entrepreneurs, they don't, they're not just product experts, no. They're product experts and market experts. They know what their customers need. They know what they want, for example, was Mr. Disney, Walt Disney, was he just a cartoonist making Mickey Mouse? Or did he understand what kind of entertainment American families want to take their children to see? He understood both. Steve Jobs, is Steve Jobs just a computer expert? Or was he Mr. User Friendly? He understood how we all want to use computers, small computers, in our home, in our car even today. Mm -hmm. So they're experts at both. Very nice, it, and, uh, it's a very nice thing. Number three, I'm sure you won't be surprised about innovation. Entrepreneurs are very innovative. They have to do something newer, better than the competition. So they're innovative, but in today's world, they're also fast moving. We call it high speed innovation. The average life of a high tech product is only six months. So they have to keep moving like this, you know. So high-speed innovation. In fact, the great Japanese entrepreneur, Akio Morita, he said, moving quickly, he was the founder of Sony, Sony Corporation, moving quickly is the entrepreneur's secret weapon. It's the easiest way to beat the competition. And finally, number four, we only teach four practices. <laughs> number four is this one here. Yes, entrepreneurs are self-motivated. They're self-inspired. They want to go to work. We don't have to force them to go to work. They love to work. There's two reasons for that, I think. Number one, it's this one here, sense of mission. They like to go to work because they love what they do. That's one. But secondly, secondly, it's an old-fashioned word. We call it consequence. If they work hard all week and they take in $1,000 sales, end of the week, they open their cash box, $1,000. They can go home and say, 
say to their spouse or friend or whatever, we made $1,000 this week. We can feed the children. We can pay the rent on the house. Good week. Good performance, good consequence. If their product is no good or they're lazy, end of the week, they open the cash box, zero, no sales. They have to go home and say to the man, has to go tell his wife, I made zero money this week. And she says, how are we going to feed the children? Problem, you see? So the entrepreneur, I think, is blessed, really, by the notion of immediate consequence for performance. Very powerful, very powerful. And let me tell you how it works in most big organizations. See if this sounds familiar to you, even in corporations. After I was a consultant, I went to work for a great American company called American Express. Okay, you probably saw their credit cards and so on. American Express. Nice company, very nice company. I would never say anything too bad about them. But I learned something important at that big company. I was working in the bank. The inter they have an international bank. If I brought in $10 million of deposits that week, perhaps from the Middle East somewhere, I've got some Arabs who bring in $10 million. Fantastic performance huh? for, for me, for the month. I did a great job. End of the month, my paycheck came, my salary. I opened the paycheck, it was $1,250. That was my salary. I, I remember it very much to this day, $1,250 for the month. Fantastic month, $1,250. Next month, I don't have a fantastic month. I have an average month. I bring in $1 million of deposits to the bank, okay? Very average, nothing special. End of the month, my salary comes, I open the envelope. $1,250, again. I think, wow, that's interesting. I bring in 10 million, I get 1,250. I bring in 1 million, I get the same. So I'm going to try an experiment. Next month, I'm not going to do a damn thing all month. <laughs> I'm going to see what happens, you know? So all month, the next month, I go to my desk and I sit there and I sleep, you know? Now, in American Express, we learned how to sleep with our eyes open, though. We, you know, <laughs> like this. I was like this all month, like this, you know? Do you have any staff at the university who can sleep with their eyes open? Maybe, huh? It's a, it's a great skill to have, you know? Okay. So I slept all month and did nothing. End of the month, my pay came, my salary check. How much? $1,250. See, for most people, there's no consequence. If they do good, average, or not so good, more or less the same, more or less. Now, if you steal money, if you steal a car, you get caught. So there's some concept for extreme. But extreme behavior, yes, but normal behavior, no. Okay, so uh, these are the four practices. And my favorite entrepreneur, maybe, in the world is uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, sir. Where is he? Okay. These are examples. Oh, let me give you an example for each one. Sense of mission. This, this man is from Iceland. I, I want to use this one here because Iceland is much smaller than Mauritius. Okay? Iceland only has 268,000 people. But what did this man do? He has created a biotech company, Decode Genetics, in Iceland. World famous company in Iceland studying the 12 major diseases of the world. Why? This is the power of an idea. He was a medical professor at Harvard, actually, Harvard Medical School, when the biotech revolution began in 1985. He understood something. He was an academic, OK? He understood something about biotech. His country, Iceland, would make the world's best laboratory for genetic testing. Why? because nobody had immigrated to Iceland for 900 years. They were all the same, the same people. He told me, 
Larry, we could not do genetic testing in New York City. Too many different types of people coming and going and so on. But in Iceland, we're all the same. You think? In fact, Iceland is the only country in the world where the phone telephone book is listed by people's first names. There's only about eight family names. You see? Amazing. It's just amazing. Anyway, they want to know about women's breast cancer. They, they study 500 Icelandic women with breast cancer. They look at the genetic makeup. They come over here, 500 Icelandic women with no breast cancer, and they look for the difference. What is it? Easy to do, easy research. I mean, relatively easy. Brilliant idea in a small country, you see? So I tell, I'm telling everyone here in Mauritius, the next Steve Jobs should come from here. Why not? See? Okay. Number two, well, here he is, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs says, managing is the easy part, inventing the world's next great product is what's hard <coughs> in business. So true, it's so true. You know? Number three, high speed. Here's my South American example. He's from Brazil. Brazil in the news today, huh? World Cup, exciting. All right. This man, Lito Rodriguez, he invented the product dry wash. The way to wash your automobile with no water. It, it's an environmental friendly product. Doesn't use fresh water to clean machines and cars and so on. Very wonderful product. The power of an idea, huh? He wasn't a chemist. He was just an average person. But he figured a way. He, he uh, went to his teachers at school and found a way to make a biodegradable cleaning. Right? And they clean the cars with these rags. Very nice, very nice business. Number four, Asia, China, Singapore. Jenny Tay, retail. She likes, she likes fine jewelry. She opens uh, jewelry stores in Singapore, Tokyo, Melbourne, Australia, Sydney, and so on. Very successful, self-inspired, self-inspired. She was a poor girl. She was a Chinese in Malaysia. And she rose herself up and created an empire of retail jewelry stores. Huh? Her idea about people is very nice. She said, employees become your corporate family. Mm -hmm. You share the good and the bad consequences every day. OK, so these are the these are the practice. Here's the Disney example. Mr. Disney said, the inclination of my life has been to make to do things and make things which will give pleasure to people in new and exciting ways. By doing that, I please and satisfy myself. Sense of mission, number one, sense of mission. Product, customer, innovation, something new and creative, innovation. And finally, self-inspired. By doing that, I please and satisfy myself. I inspire myself from my work. I am motivated by my work. This is why it's so important to do something you love. You know, because it inspires you. It inspires you. Okay. Uh, now, that's what entrepreneurship is, those four practices, more or less, we think that's what it is. Why is it important today, in the world today, why is it so important to people, companies, and even countries today? And I think the answer, partly, is it's the, way, it's the best way, the fastest, surest, cheapest way to compete and prosper in the 21st century economy. We do live in a global economy, if you hadn't noticed, huh? But economically, there's always a lot of bad news, depressing, okay? So sometimes we can get depressed about our future prosperity, huh? For example, <coughs> in the year 2000, the United Nations said, we're going to eliminate poverty in, by 2015. Made a big campaign, you remember this? It was called the Millennium Project. We will eliminate poverty by 2015. So today is 2014. How are we doing <laughs> so far, huh? We got one year to go, huh? <laughs> Bad news, depressing. It's depressing mainly because the rich poor gap today is wider than ever in history. The gap between the rich people and the poor people so wide, so wide today. It's a huge problem in the world today, right? Huh? Number three, worldwide job creation has become a race to the bottom. 
Manufacturing jobs are going to the cheapest labor market. You don't want to have that in your country. You want to have other kinds of industry. You don't, you don't want to become the next Bangladesh of the world, of course. You know? But this is where the jobs are being created today, low cost. It's quite sad, actually. Huh? Number four, this is quite controversial. Depends a bit on your religion, your beliefs, but the job-baby ratio, a very important economic rule. Hmm? For every job you, for every baby you have in Mauritius, for every two babies, you need to, be, to create one job, at least. Otherwise, you become poor, you see? Because people need jobs. Huh? <laughs> but unfortunately, in most poorer countries, birth rates are much higher than job creation rates. <coughs> this is a very important economic standard to remember, all right? It doesn't matter how many babies you want to have. Have as many babies as you want, but for every two babies, you need one job to be created in the future, huh? Otherwise, you become poor as a country, okay? Simple rule. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and finally, we always have some global economic crisis. We just went through the worst one in 70 years. This is all the bad news. Fortunately for us, there's lots of good news. Huh? Here's the good news. It's mostly about entrepreneurial activity. Number one, the engine of prosperity of every country in the world today is small business. It is not giant businesses. Huh? It is small businesses that create 80% of all the new jobs, 80 to 90%, created by entrepreneurial small business. So <coughs> national economies need small business to create. In fact, the big companies, Unilever, IBM, they're trying to decrease employment. They're trying to become so efficient they don't need people. You go to the airport today, you can't find any people. You check in by yourself, you do everything for yourself, huh? The, air, the airlines, someday they'll get rid of the pilots even, you know? <laughs> Self-piloted planes. Okay, number three. This is such good news for anyone in Mauritius who wants to become an entrepreneur. We do live in a global economy. If you invent a product, make a nice product in Mauritius today, tomorrow, you can sell this in the United States, Germany, Brazil, even China. You can sell this worldwide. It's easy to do. No problem anymore. Now, if her grandfather created a company 60 years ago, 70 years ago in Mauritius, he had a product. He could only sell this in his neighborhood or his town. He had no hope of selling this to Europe or North America 50 years ago. But today, as an entrepreneur, you can sell your product tomorrow everywhere in the world. So it's a huge advantage to the new entrepreneurs of the world. Right? You're no longer constrained by your home market. Right? Number four, another advantage if you want to be an entrepreneur, there are huge niche markets, small markets, available to the entrepreneur. For example, if you're in the pharmaceutical industry, making medicine, the big pharmaceutical companies, they cannot afford to research a product, a medicine, if it doesn't have a market potential of at least $100 million. It's too expensive to do the research. So Glaxo and these companies, they're only looking at big diseases, all right? That leads for us, the medical entrepreneurs, there, there are thousands of medical entrepreneurs in the world today who are creating medicine and procedures for small diseases, niche markets, huh? Yeah, for like uh, leprosy and so on, so small markets, right? You, you know why we don't have a cure for leprosy? Only 40,000 cases a year, small market, see? I used to tell my friends, if you're going to get sick, get something popular. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> Startup capital available everywhere. Money's available. If you, if you have a good idea, the money will come. Believe me. There's more money available in the world than good ideas. That's a truth today, okay? Uh, number six, this one I like very much. 
Entrepreneurship, we call it the ultimate meritocracy. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter whether you're a girl or a boy. It doesn't matter who your family was anymore. It doesn't matter so much. Maybe in Mauritius it matters to go to this university. But usually it doesn't matter where you go to school. Uh, if you have a great idea, you cannot be stopped as an entrepreneur. You don't need a background. You don't need your family. You, know, you come up with a great idea. This, these are rags to riches stories are quite true. They're quite true, you know? OK, and finally, uh, foreign direct investment, of course, follows entrepreneurs. The highest area of foreign direct investment in my country, USA, is Silicon Valley. Foreign money wants to go to Silicon Valley. They don't want to go to the inner city of New York, where there's a lot of poverty still, OK? All right, let's go. The three applications, yourself, your company, your country. <coughs> let's talk about you first, yourself. Suppose you want to become an entrepreneur, all right? Now you know what the four steps are, the four practices, OK? Sense of mission, customer product, and so on. These are some of the universities we teach at. All of these universities are teaching some type of entrepreneurship curriculum today. I can tell you honestly, 25, 30 years ago when I started my business, no universities were teaching entrepreneurship. In fact, Harvard, this business school, they didn't have their first entrepreneurship course until 1987. Not too long ago, you see? So it wasn't a popular thing to study. Now all these universities are teaching it. <clears throat> Why? Because there's lots of people who want to become entrepreneurs, seeking jobs and prosperity. The new entrepreneurs, the young people today, say, what's the risk? The biggest risk may be going to work for IBM. If you lose your job for no reason, they just downsize, you see? Entrepreneurs are in control of their own destiny in this world today. Number three, the research says 70% of all young people are dreaming about entrepreneurship, dreaming to be. They want to own their own company. So it's a very popular idea today in the world. There's three to four million new entrepreneurs each year, a lot of people. If four million people are doing it, it can't be too difficult, right? It's not so, not so hard. This is not brain surgery or flying to the moon. All right? It's making a simple product. Okay, in most cases. Who are these new entrepreneurs in the world? They're average people. They're not Einstein. They have average IQ. In America, they're 35 years old. They spent eight years working in a big company or, or even a university. So they have some experience, adult experience. Right? They're average people, like you and me. Right? Finally, meritocracy. They have the idea, nobody can stop me. I'm my own boss. If I fail, it's because of me. It's not because of my boss, all right? That, that kind of thing. Okay, the risk, what about the risk? Here's Steve, uh, Bill Gates. He said, risk, what risk? I started Microsoft for $700. I, know, I can tell by looking, all of you have $700, okay? No problem. So you can come up with enough to start another company, huh? Today, of course, we know Bill Gates, richest man in the country, US. Maybe the richest man in the world. But getting rich is not the goal. That's not, that, no, that's not why he did it. The three most important, this is for the young people. If you ever want to start your own business, here's the three most important questions you have to answer for yourself, okay? Number one, question number one. What do I like to do? What, am I in, what do I love to do? What am I interested in? Fabrics, gardening, computers, uh, mechanics. What, what do I like to do? Question one. Question number two, what am I good at doing? What do I know how to do? See? This one's not so difficult because if you like to do something but you don't know how to do it, you can go to school and learn how to do it. Okay, this education can help you. So question one, what do I like to do? Question two, what am I good at doing? Question three, what market needs can I meet? 
with what I like to do and what I'm going to do. So what market needs to be? These are the three most important questions for any starting up any business. Can you imagine starting a business of something you hate or something you're no good at or there's no market need? Of course not. These are the questions you have to answer. And every one of you can answer these questions. It's quite easy. You make a list of all the things you like to do. You make a list of the things you're good at doing. You go out and look around the market. You decide, is there something I can do the market needs? Voila, you're in business. No, not that complicated. <clears throat> Here are the four practices applied to, sorry, to the uh, individuals right here. Sense of mission, customer product, high-speed innovation, self-inspired behavior. So what we, what we expect with the young entrepreneur today is it's people, young people, who want to do something great with their life. There's, a, there's several ways to do something great with your life. You can become a teacher. That's great, I think. You can become a scientist. That's great. Great way to do your life. Or you can become an entrepreneur. That's also great. Right? There's, there's several great things you can do, but please listen to me. Try to do something that excites you in your life. Okay? And this, those of you in university, this is your time. This is your chance. You're so lucky. You, know? you can sit here and study those things that interest you and prepare you for life. Very nice. We know that entrepreneurship is the best economic tool ever invented for individuals, for companies, and for entire countries. And three, don't do it just to get rich. The wrong reason. I, I, I've never met a successful, I, honestly, I've never met a successful entrepreneur who said, I only became an entrepreneur to get rich. They do it because they have a product they want to sell, or economic necessity, they're poor, something like that. You know, to get out of poverty, okay, but not to get rich. And finally, nobody can stop you. Okay, the company, you see these, these are some of our clients around the world. What do you notice about all these companies? They're huge. They're big corporations and they become bureaucracies, okay? That's what happens. Bureaucracy, the enemy of innovation. 84% of the biggest companies in America no longer exist. 70% from 1955 to 2005, gone. Family-run businesses outperform the MBA-type businesses by 35%. The family-owned business is a fantastic way, a fantastic model for business success. If you read the business magazines, you would think, oh, you have to get an MBA. You have to be business <coughs> professional man. No, family-run businesses are quite successful, actually. Why? Because families have a long-term interest in the business. The professionally managed company only they, they live from quarter to quarter to quarter. Huh? Stock price. Okay. Life cycle of companies. There it is. I'm going to jump ahead here to the country. We'll close on this section here. Country. 15 years ago, The Economist magazine had an important article about the mystery of economic growth. And in this article, The Economist, a great magazine, said the number one question in economics today, why are some countries rich and other countries poor? And no economist has given us the answer, really, that we can rely on. Many people have a theory, right? But it's an important question. And so if you look at the possibilities, look at, we find that economies have these life cycles, OK? They rise, they grow, people become too rich and complacent, they decline and they fall down. The test here is, there has never been a rich country that has stayed rich forever. Never happened. Not the Chinese, the Ming Dynasty, no. The Greeks, no. The Romans, no. The Spanish, no. The British, no. 
The Americans were, were beginning to decline. We're not going to stay rich forever. We're declining. Right? Life cycle the economy. So the questions are, the important questions for the country are, why do, <coughs> why do the poor get rich? How, how does this happen? What happened to Taiwan and Singapore? How did they go from being very poor to very rich in 50 years? How does that happen? Number, question number two, why do the rich usually get poor? What happened to Great Britain in the year 1900? Great Britain was the richest country in the world, by far. By 1970, they went to the IMF to beg for loans. They had become poor by 1970. What happened to Great Britain? What happened to Spain? What happened to these rich countries, you see? Now, Great Britain, we must say this, to our good friends in Great Britain, they had a rebound. Great Britain found some answers on how to become prosperous again. Very interesting, no? Huh? Doesn't happen very often, but it, can, but it gives us hope. It can happen, okay? And finally, the last question, why do some poor stay poor forever? There are some poor countries in the world who seem that they will always be poor. I hope not, but it seems that way. For example, one country, Bangladesh. This country, this area of the world, has always been poor, always. And it looks like maybe they always will be. You know, we say that God put Bangladesh in the wrong place. Huh? <laughs> because how can you become rich if every year you have a terrible flood that destroys your crops, destroys your houses? And it, it's impossible, very difficult, okay? But my interest, our interest here is number one. How do the poor get rich? And the example I like to use is uh, here. Here's the, here. Right now, if you look at the life cycle, here's Spain and Greece, more or less economically dead. All right? Could change. Could be like Great Britain. They could come back. Why not? Here's the USA and Japan. We're just, just beginning to decline. Here's Chile, South America, a very vibrant economy. Here's the tigers of Southeast Asia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore. And here's the two giants coming. Boom. Huh? China, India. Boom. Okay? High growth. And they're a startup high growth period. All right? Entrepreneurial growth on this side, complacent decline on this side. All right? Okay. To find the answer, I went to the most successful finance minister of the 20th century, K.T. Lee in Taiwan. All right? He's the only economist that holds an honorary chair in both Cambridge and Harvard, the School of Economics. He's also dead. He died five years ago. Have you, are you beginning to notice that most of my interviewees, most of my examples are dead people? Uh -huh. It's, it's, it's partly because I'm becoming older, but it's also, I like dead examples, dead people, because you can't change their record, okay? <laughs> you can't go back and change their record. For example, you haven't heard me say anything positive about Facebook, right? Because 10 years from now, Facebook may be bankrupt. Who knows, okay? When, uh, when the founder of Facebook dies, then I'll quote him also. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, K.T. Lee was a great man, fabulous. I had the honor of interviewing him for three hours on tape, tape recorder. I asked him, how did Taiwan become so rich? In, in 1950, Taiwan was poorer than Albania. It was the poorest country in the world. Nothing. Didn't even have enough water in Taiwan to live, you see? And no raw material, no resources, you know? How did, and by 19, uh, by the year 2000, Taiwan had, has the highest per capita foreign reserves of any country in the world. Per capita, the richest country in the world. Richer than Saudi Arabia, richer than China, richer than US. So I said, how did you do that? Here's his first answer. Huh? The greatest advantage I had as economic affairs minister was I never had a course in economics. Now, are there any professors of economics here? Huh? 
this was a joke. He was all, don't get insulted. He was only making a joke about studying economics. But he did say, to create prosperity in the country, it really takes common sense, not economic theories. And I think that's true in many areas of life. You know, common sense is so valuable. Huh? So here's his common sense answer right here. Number one, he's the one, he invented the job baby ratio idea. You've got to align the job baby ratio in the country. Hmm? Number two, never print money you don't have. It creates inflation. Inflation, the number one enemy uh, of uh, prosperity. Number three, government's job, look at this nice, government's job is to make people rich. That's our job in Taiwan. Our job was to create prosperity for the people. That's quite nice. It's okay. Number four, timing more important than ideology. You cannot have the same economic program when you're starting up as when you're a powerful nation. Sometimes you need protection, high tariffs, high taxes. Other times you need free trade. So he says, we can't be political about, and he says, this is, the, this is what's wrong with capitalism or communism or socialism. It depends on the time of your life cycle. Where are you? Very smart, too. And finally, to grow the business. For example, the New York statistics, statistics from New York City, a client of ours, by the way, the man in New York City told me, the average startup cost of a company in New York City, my, this is micro enterprise, small, 14,000 US, average cost, okay? He said, look at the other costs we have from the city government. To keep one family on welfare one year, $25,000. To send one student to Harvard or MIT to one good school, 35,000, this is very expensive in the US, huh? 35,000 scholarship. To keep one criminal in prison one year, $45,000. For the cost of one criminal, we can start three companies up here, see? And help three families get out of poverty and raise their prosperity. So it's a bargain for the, for the <coughs> governments. Uh, it's the fastest, surest, and cheapest way to produce sustainable prosperity. Now, it's okay if Toyota wants, it's good, if Toyota wants to come to Mauritius and build a car plant here and they hire 1,000 people, very nice. But the problem is, next year, Toyota may go to Tanzania. They may stop here, see? So if you're in the board of investment here, you have to think, okay? We can't just have foreign companies coming in to invest. We need home growing companies because they will be loyal and stay in Mauritius and it creates sustainable prosperity, okay? Very important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the policies required <coughs> for a national government are like this. Number one, we want to see entrepreneur development as a key economic strategy. We hope to see the government making big investments in small business, small business, Educa this is for educators. We want the educators of the country to be educating our young people in the future products and sciences of the world. The future products, not yesterday's technology, but the future technology. Huh? Very good. So ed education plays a huge role in entrepreneurship, a big role. And in fact, I, I must say, it is the technical science schools the engineering, the, 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 and the, particularly the health sciences these days, these are the areas where the entrepreneurs are going to come from. These types of schools in, in the university. Um, okay? <clears throat> and finally, of course, create and honor the entrepreneurs. Okay. The conditions required in the country of Mauritius and everywhere, number one, we need an entrepreneur friendly culture in Mauritius. Is it a friendly culture? Can it be easy to start a business, you know, and so on? Number two, it may take a bit of money, 14,000, something like, maybe 700 uh, only. <laughs> you know the great company DHL? Founded for no money, zero. Many great companies are founded for nothing. They just start, you know. Uh, and finally, a 
bit of knowledge. When we say entrepreneur friendly country, we mean this. Who are the cultural heroes today in Mauritius? Who do the young people look up to? Huh? Is it entrepreneurs? Or is it uh, athletes? Rock stars? Who? Who are the young people admiring in the country? Who are the cultural heroes of the, of the economy? I would say today, uh, in, in both in the UK and the US, young people are, for the first time, admiring entrepreneurs. One of the most popular people in Great Britain is Richard Branson, okay? He's an icon to young people. In my country, the most popular person in the country is Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs, not President Obama, not anybody, but Steve Jobs. All young people want to be like him, you see? So this is what you need. You need some way to get younger people thinking, I can do that. This is the way I can do it. Education system has to be friendly to the entrepreneur. How many scientists and engineers do you produce? How many startups and IPO capital is available? Uh, patents issued, you have, see, there's your patents. If you, ha if you come up with a great idea, Mauritius, you want a worldwide patent on it. Why not? It's protected, you see? And finally, business startup. How many business startups do you have here per capita? These are statistics you can easily see. Uh, a bit of money, 14,000. These statistics come from US, but I think it might be similar in Mauritius. Most startup companies still using sa uh, personal savings. 73% of all American startups use some personal savings. They also use some credit cards. Now, I don't suggest credit card financing, but it can be quite useful in your startup phase to get an extra 5,000 US and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, loans from friends and relatives, very common still. Hmm? Can be a little tricky, huh? If you borrow money from your father-in-law. <laughs> 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 okay. Here's government loans. Government loans today, much more important than bank loans to the entrepreneur. 7% versus 3 and in a, in a poor country, say some of the African economies, where there is no personal savings and no family money, the government has to step in and do more, provide more startup money. Huh? Uh, bank loans are very small, and venture capital equity very small. Here's a new source. This is an interesting source. Internet crowdfunding. There's several platforms on the internet you can put out your business idea, and amazing, it's like magic. You start receiving money from people, and they don't want shares, they just want to one of the products when it's available. You know, the internet, fund, internet crowdfunding, very interesting. The most popular one today is called kickstarter.com, but you can go on the web, on Google, type in crowdfunding, and you'll see a whole list of these companies. Very nice, nice. So there's plenty of ways to raise money. And finally, a bit of knowledge. Here's what I was saying here, Vice Chancellor. Graduates from engineering, biotech, computer science, even fashion design, three times more likely to start their own business than MBA graduates. Isn't that something? Yeah. Huh? And we used to think, I used to think, to start it, you should go to business school. You know? I can tell you honestly. I didn't learn one thing at Harvard about starting a company. I learned how to manage a company, but not how to start a company. I should have gone to some technical institute to learn something practical, you know, like how to make this or something like that. Huh? Very nice, OK? And uh, so the benefits of creating an entrepreneurial economy are these. It is a good way to alleviate poverty of the poorest people, helps the poorest people in the country. Number two, it can create prosperity across the entire country. Number three, it is self-sustaining, as I said. It's repeatable, doesn't go away. Number four, it attracts more foreign direct investment, so you will get more foreign investment if you have an entrepreneurial style economy. And it's cheap, it's a bargain. It's a bargain, okay. All right, so you ask your, 
So I'm going to close. Uh, we'll take questions. Get any questions, get ready with your questions. But I'll close with this again. Walt Disney said, the inclination of my life has been to do things and make things which will give pleasure to people that know in amazing ways. By doing that, I please and satisfy myself. Sense of mission, customer product focus, innovation, self-inspired. Those are the four fundamental characteristics. And so uh, best wishes for creating your own entrepreneurial economy here in Mauritius. And I can take any questions you want and even stay behind and answer any personal questions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I you. have to ask the students whether well, 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 I arrived at the beginning. It's yeah. brilliant, yeah. please. Okay. Yeah. 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 Before I leave the floor, I just would like to ask the permission of Mr. Farrell to put his slide on life cycle of companies. Okay. Because it was okay. not so innocent, my reason for asking Mr. Farrell to be here today after having listened to him. Okay. This one would have been fine. Yeah. Okay. So I think we are among us. Although we've invited other tertiary education institutions, I would ask my colleagues who are all here today, this applies to universities and this applies to Mauritius, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not going to like you. <laughs> These are open university of Mauritius, University de Mascaren, right? University of Technology will be there. So where are we colleagues? Yeah. University of Mauritius. If I listen to Mr. Farrell, we are here. This year we celebrate 49 years. Next year, 50 years of university, 100 years of College of Agriculture. So uh, counting your figures, you say 10 years here, 20 years there, so we are here. <laughs> so colleagues, that was the reason why I wanted you to be here. But you're, but you're not retiring. <laughs> So, so colleagues, this is our challenge. We are there. High growth, we are in decline. University of Mauritius, we've got to move. High speed innovation. And these are a lot of lessons we've learned today. Right? And the reason and one of the message I want to send to all my friends, colleagues, and even students, we are all here to join hands to make sure that we don't follow the natural life cycle of university. Thank you. Very nice. I have take questions from the floor. I'm sure we have many. You would like to have some water? No, I'm okay. Questions from the floor? Any questions? Hello. Yeah. First and foremost, uh, the presentation has been fantastic. Uh, at times, as consumers, we go for consumer satisfaction. Uh, in this particular case, it's uh, consumer delight. Oh, thank you. How nice. <laughs> now, just uh, uh, one off, uh, off record thing. Uh, we say have been talking about, you say 10 years and 20 years? Now, I was a student of your university 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, my question to, uh, you see, uh, being in the academic a bit, I was thinking about uh, whether we are not, uh, 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 we are at fault in the sense that we are not giving sufficient uh, importance to entrepreneurial studies itself. I'm wondering whether uh, we should not be coming up with something like entrepreneurial economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have uh, seen a few of your parameters, mm -hmm. like your job uh, baby ratio, mm -hmm. which uh, I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, spotted you on when you said uh, for every two <coughs> kids uh, taking birth, you should create one job, yeah. right? Uh, uh, meaning that uh, in a family, only one guy should uh, work. Mm -hmm. Now, but my main question is about that entrepreneurial economics itself. Because we are, we are having uh, uh, modules, we are running modules like health economics, transport economics. I am personally working on congestion economics. 
So why not give a, uh, a boost up to entrepreneurial economics? Thank you. My answer, of course, I'm very prejudiced, but whatever the university can do to make the students aware that an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial career is an option for them. They should consider it as a legitimate option, the same as they consider going to work for companies or government or whatever. That's the goal. We want them to know that it is a good option to consider for their future. So if it's a course in, eco in entrepreneurial economics, wonderful. If it's a course in straight how to start a small group, wonderful. Whatever you can do is for their benefit so that you, now we don't expect 10 out of 10 students to become entrepreneurs. That's not the point. But we want maybe two out of 10, three, to, to, enough to start so that there's a sustainable economy going. But you know something else? The skills, just as the vice chancellor is indicating for the university, the skills that we talked about here, the entrepreneurial skills, characteristics, they're very valuable in business, in any business. They're very valuable in administering the university. These are all uh, growth skills. And, and so whatever the organization is, we want to see vibrant growth. The last thing I'd say about the university uh, situation is you could put an entrepreneurial course, of course, in your business school. That's okay, no problem, okay? But we, we don't want to miss, the business students are not going to become the entrepreneurs. Usually it's going to be the scientists, the engineers, and people like that. Uh, so we would want to make sure that the entire school has the uh, availability to learn something about becoming an entrepreneur or being a micro entrepreneur in their career. I mean, think about it, doctors are entrepreneurs, lawyers are basically entrepreneurial in their businesses and so on. So it applies to every every uh, cur curriculum. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I should say I'd like to ask a question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I thank you, uh, Dr. Farrell, for this uh, brilliant speech. Unfortunately, I hold an MBA myself <laughs> from a business school. Tell, no, but my dear, <laughs> I tell everybody with an MBA, it's a cross we have to bear together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question, you know, is fundamental. We're talking about students. You know, I'm teaching myself, you know, some bits about entrepreneurial marketing, being given my own background in management. Yeah. My question is, why can't academics develop an entrepreneurial culture? Why academics, you know, like this is in most yeah. universities of the world, because you've been touring the world. Yeah. China, Taiwan have already been showing players about auto entrepreneurship. How can we convert this university into, you know, this entrepreneurial, you know, flair? I, I think, we think, you know, uh, why academics can do that? Well, the, the vice chancellor is absolutely right. The first, the first step is to recognize where you are in the life cycle. If, if you never know, if you never think that decline is possible, you'll never worry about it. But to be aware of where you are in your life here, are you a vibrant, high growth, innovative university, or are you just more or less taking it easy? going on your past reputation, you know? So num step number one is to know where you are, right? Step number two, I think, is to, to apply certain practical steps that are uh, uh, very applicable to university life. Innovation in curriculum, a big area, you know? Just as this gentleman said, why not have a course on entrepreneurial <coughs> economics and blah, 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 you know? So innovation in curriculum, innovation in recruitment of students. What kind of students do you want to come here? These are all highly innovative things. And of course, I'm a big fan of university life, okay? I, I think that this, this is where we have the chance to impact these people, you know? And so let's make sure that they come out of a university that is not bureaucratic, is not backward looking and is preparing them for the future, okay? And for the future jobs. I mean, everyone needs a job, basically, right? 
So we want to be strong in sciences, strong in biotech, strong in engineering, strong in environmental health, whatever those subjects are. Not that we shouldn't be strong in literature and poetry and history. Very nice. Uh, very nice. All that's very nice. But we also want to give them tools that they can be successful with in their working life, too. But I, I am very, very, I mean, the fact that she came to hear me talk, she took time from her busy schedule to come and hear me talk yesterday, and two, uh, yesterday, two days ago, and was interested enough to ask me to come here. You know, it's a good sign to me. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I would like just to say that I fully support Mr. Allen in saying that everybody can become an entrepreneur, be an engineer, a scientist, a doctor. It's all about mindset and putting the conditions, as you said. And uh, I was telling him that I particularly like that slide about that minister from Taiwan, Taiwan. because I'm a vice chancellor without one minute of training in management. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other question? No? So one, we take the three questions and then we will have to stop. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I just start by saying excellent presentation. Oh, hear me. Thank you. Um, I'm from the UK. I'm, I lecture law in Middlesex University. I'm okay. Proud to say that uh, Middlesex, we're looking forward uh, to presenting more business oriented skills. I've set up at Middlesex University an employment learning centre uh, which instills, nice. which instills um, business skills, entrepreneurship, uh, presentation skills, etc. My question is that the British staff, including myself, are very adept in bringing in uh, cultural uh, mechanisms which uh, engenders um, uh, business skills within students. The issue is we're having is that many students here, brilliant as they are, yeah. are not used to having, um, or not used to taking the step of being an entrepreneur. Uh -huh. And that's the biggest problem we have. Mm -hmm. um, academically brilliant, but um, it's something that we're trying to teach. I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade, Good. so I'm used to being self-employed. It's getting that step and making British students adept to take that first step. Yeah. Can you advise me to how to how to deal with this? Okay, my, my advice would be quite simple. Uh, I think the students need to be confident about two things. That number one, entrepreneurship is not. Uh, brain surgery or flying to the moon. Th this is not something reserved for only 2% of the population, okay? Uh, step number two, they need to learn enough about it to realize it's something that they can do if they wanted to. And we want them to come out of university, I, I, I would prefer that they come out of university and go to work for an established organization for five or 10 years. I think that's wonderful training. And maybe at age 30, then consider, what am I now prepared to do as an entrepreneur? Uh, but they, we want them to come out of university knowing that it's something they can do and they have enough confidence to know that these are things I, uh, that I'm capable of. You know? And, and I, what you're doing in Middlesex is fantastic you know, as they go out some kind of job uh, advice and counseling and so on. Wonderful. I'm happy I didn't sign at Middlesex University. <laughs> yeah, there was someone else. Okay. Yeah. I want to say, you know, one way of testing how entrepreneurial you are is by, for the UOM, you must see how many job skills have you created compared to the University of Mascarene or UGM. I think you will have to start collecting that kind of data. Oh. That's one thing. The second thing about the family entrepreneurship, I think in Mauritius there's a strong family on entrepreneurship. In fact, that's a research okay. that I'm doing. Good. And I won't, be, I won't be surprised about 30, 40 percent of Mauritian companies are families. And uh -huh. they might even go up to 1,700, 1,800. Okay. That's the second point. The thing about Taiwan, you know, Taiwan was one of the most dramatic demographic transition countries. Mm. And it was followed by Mauritius. We managed to bring down our birth rate from what was it, just two something else within the period. So I think in this aspect of entrepreneurial development, we will be following, we have got all the, the things necessary to follow Taiwan. In okay, and let's remember, uh, very nice, let's remember this, that usually, not always, but usually the family-owned business usually 
is what we call lifestyle entrepreneurship. It is a business that will likely stay small because it's just the way that family makes a living with a restaurant or a small hotel or something. So that, and we need that. We also need the entrepreneurs who can create a lot of jobs. So we, we want to have both kinds. The family, the, uh, the, the uh, what we call the lifestyle entrepreneur is, tr is wonderful for bringing people out of poverty into a family-owned, home-based business even, okay? On the other hand, we want companies here, companies of the future, that will create 500 new jobs in this country. Uh, for that, we need the Steve Jobs types of, of businesses, the Apple computer type businesses, okay? But both are very legitimate and very important parts of your economy. Fam small family owned and the bigger company, the, the one that has the potential to grow bigger. Okay, can we take last question? Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Um, my name is Wilson. Um, I'm a student from YK Business School oh. in Mauritius. Um, my question is, you said everyone can become an entrepreneur. Um, and then I asked myself, if everyone become an entrepreneur, who will work for who? <laughs> this is the little dark secret we keep to ourselves. We don't really want everyone to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> we only want us, ourselves. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Of course. And I'll tell you this. There are many people in the world who have wonderful lives and are not entrepreneurs. We know that, of course. There's many ways to have a good life, a good occupation, and so on. So I would never say you will, you can't be something great unless you're an entrepreneur. No, of course not. No, of course not. So we respect all those things. But we know that we need 10, 20 percent of graduates coming out who are going to make big contributions to the economy of the country. And those are going to be entrepreneur type people creating jobs and businesses for, for the country, really. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will have some uh, refreshments so that we can continue to discuss with Mr. Powell. And uh, the last word for this morning is that, uh, again, on this, I'm reminding my colleagues uh, to stay on the entrepreneurial side so that we don't fall on the uh, other position. Now, before ending, I would like to ask uh, Professor Sudarshan Jagiso, our cha Chairman of Council and Co-Chancellor, to come on stage to offer a gift to Mr. Powell. We make sure he doesn't forget us. I, actually, it's a gift uh, from entrepreneurs in Mauritius, wow, nice. something that has been built locally from, for, from uh, Mauritius, and I'm sure that uh, you will enjoy it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so with these words, I thank Mr. Powell for having taken the time. He's flying, he's 18 hours. And uh, by the way, we've given him a bird so that he doesn't sit next to an entrepreneur on his flight back. And uh, I thank BBOI for having given us this opportunity. I thank all uh, my colleagues at the university who have really supported uh, me in this idea and about all the organization. And also I thank you all audience for having been present this morning. Thank you. <laughs>